Nick, I'm not, this is the last time I'm going to say it. You have to kill Eileen Morris because she'll kill again. Hey, what up? Welcome back to the playground. Welcome if you're new here. It is me, Angie Lee, and we are into a Halloween edition. Today's story is about the American serial killer Eileen Carol Bornos. She killed seven men uh, in Florida in 1989 and 1990 by shooting them at Point Lake Range. Eileen Lee Carol Warnos was born Eileen Carol Pittman on February 29, 1956, and she died of lethal injection at the Florida State Prison on October 9, 2002. She claimed that all of the homicides were in self-defense due to victims either having raped or attempted to rape her while she was servicing them. I never showed any provocations whatsoever. It was very nice, very decent, very clean, very ladylike. I didn't even swear in front of my clients. And a lot of my clients, I talked about Jesus and I talked political, both mixed together, and we never argued. So there was no provocation whatsoever. There was no need for them to look for the closest weapon in the vehicle and try to use it on me to rape me. Two did, five tried. Eileen never met her father, as he was in prison at the time of her birth. Lee Dale Pittman was diagnosed with schizophrenia and later convicted of sex crimes against children. He committed suicide by hanging in prison on January 30th, 1969. In January 1960, when Eileen was almost four years old, Diane, her mother, abandoned her children, leaving them with their maternal grandparents, both alcoholics. They legally adopted both Eileen and her bro older brother, Keith, on March 18, 1960. By the age of 11, Eileen began engaging in sexual activities in school in exchange for cigarettes, drugs, and food. She had also engaged in sexual activities with her brother. Eileen said that her grandfather had sexually abused and beaten her when she was a child. In 1970, at age 14, she became pregnant after having been raped by an accomplice of her grandfather. She gave birth to a boy at a home for unwed mothers on March 23rd, 1971. And the child was placed for adoption. A few months after her son was born, she dropped out of school at about the same time that her grandmother died of liver failure. When Eileen was 15, her grandfather threw her out of the house. She began supporting herself as a prostitute living in the woods near her home. On May 27, 1974, at age 18, she was arrested in Jefferson County, Colorado for DUI, disorderly conduct, and firing a 22 caliber pistol from a moving vehicle. She was later charged with failure to appear. In 1976, at age 20, Eileen hitchhiked to Florida where she met 69-year-old Yacht Club president named Louis Gratz Fell. They married quickly. However, Eileen continuously involved herself in confrontations at the bar and went to jail briefly for assault. She also hit Louis with his own cane, leading him to gain a restraining order against her within weeks of the marriage. They annulled their marriage on July 21st after only nine weeks. She returned to Michigan, where on July 14, 1976, she was arrested in Antrim County and charged with assault and disturbing the peace for throwing a cue ball at a bartender's head. On July 17th of 1976, her brother Keith died of esophageal cancer and she received $10,000 from his life insurance. In August, 1976, she was given a $105 fine for drunk driving. She used the money inherited from her brother to pay the fine and spent the rest within two months buying luxuries, including a new car, which she wrecked shortly thereafter. On May 20th, 1981, at 25, Eileen was arrested in Edgewater, Florida for the armed robbery of a convenience store where she stole $35 and two packs of cigarettes. She was sentenced to prison on May 4, 1982, and released on June 30, 1983. 
On May 1st, 1984, she was arrested for attempting to pass forged checks at a bank in Key West. On November 30th, 1985, she was named as a suspect in the theft of a revolver and ammunition in Pesco County. On January 4th, 1986, when Eileen was 30, she was arrested in Miami and charged with car theft, resisting arrest and obstruction of justice for providing identification bearing her aunt's name. Miami police officers found a 38 caliber revolver and a box of ammunition in the stolen car. On June 2nd, Volusia County Deputy Sheriff's detained her for questioning after a male companion accused her of pulling a gun in his car and demanding $200. She was found to be carrying spare ammunition and police discovered a 22 pistol under the passenger seat. Around this time, Eileen met Tyra Moore, a hotel maid at a Dayton Beach lesbian bar. They moved in together and Eileen supported them with her earnings as a prostitute. Up until her execution, Eileen claimed to still be in love with Tyra. Oh yeah, Ty always knew everything I was doing. So you were very close. Yeah, we're. All right. <laughs> and I still miss her, and I still love her. Eileen Warnos murdered seven men within a period of 12 months. Richard Charles Mallory, age 51, November 30th, 1989, electronic store owner in Clearwater. Aileen's first victim was a convicted rape, rapist whom she claimed to have killed in self-defense. She claimed she was sodomized and brutally beaten after being driven to an abandoned area for sexual requests. Two days later, a Volusia County Deputy Sheriff found Mallory's abandoned vehicle. On December 13th, his body was found several miles away in a wooded area. He had been shot several times. Two bullets to the left lung were found to have been the cause of death. David Andrew Spears, age 47, construction worker in Winter Garden. He was declared missing as of May 19, 1990. On June 1, 1990, his naked body was found along US Route 19 in Florida in Citrus County. He had been shot six times by a 22 pistol. Charles Edmund Karskadim age 40, May 31st, 1990, part-time rodeo worker. On June 6, 1990, his body was found in Pasco County. He had been shot nine times with a 20 caliber weapon. The body had been wrapped in an electric blanket and was badly decomposing when found. Witnesses saw Eileen in possession of Charles' car and she had also pawned a gun identified as belonging to the victim. Peter Abraham Seams, age 65, retired merchant seaman. In June 1990, Seams left Jupiter, Florida for Kansas. On July 4th, 1990, his car was found in Orange Springs, Florida. Him and Eileen were seen abandoning the car and her palm print was found on the interior door handle. His body was never found and she was not sentenced for his murder. Troy Eugene Burris, age 50, sausage salesman from Ocala. On July 31st, 1990, he was reported missing. On August 4th, 1990, his body was found in a wooded area along State Road 19 in Marion County. He had been shot twice. Charles Richard Dick Humphreys, Age 56, September 11, 1990. Retired U.S. Air Force Major, former state child abuse investigator, and former chief of police. On September 12, 1990, his body was found in Marion County. He was fully clothed and had been shot six times in the head and torso. His car was found in Sweeney County. Walter Geno Antonio. Age 62. Trucker, security guard, and police reservist. On November 19, 1990, Antonio's nearly naked body was found near a remote logging road in Dixie County. He had been shot four times. Five days later, his car was found in Brevard County. On July 4, 1990, 
Eileen and Tyra abandoned Peter Sims' car after they were involved in an accident. Witnesses who had seen the women driving the victims' cars provided police with their names and descriptions, resulting in a media campaign to locate them. Police also found some of the victims' belongings in pawn shops and retrieved fingerprints matching those found in the victims' cars. Eileen had a criminal record in Florida and her fingerprints were on file. On January 9, 1991, at 35, Eileen Warnos was arrested on an outstanding warrant at the Last Resort, a biker bar in Volusia County. Police located Tyra Moore the next day in Granton, Pennsylvania. She agreed to elicit a confession from Eileen in exchange for immunity from prosecution. Tyra returned with Florida police where she was put up in a motel under police guidance, she made numerous telephone calls to Eileen, pleading for help in clearing her name. Three days later, on January 16, 1991, Eileen confessed to the murders. She claimed the men had tried to rape her and she killed them in self-defense. A year later, on January 14, 1992, Eileen went to trial for the murder of Richard Charles Mallory. At her sentencing, psychiatrists for the defense testified that she was mentally unstable and had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Four days later, she was sentenced to death. On March 13, 1992, Eileen pleaded no contest to the murders of Humphreys, Burris, and Spears. I have made peace with my Lord and I have asked forgiveness. I am sorry that my acts of self-defense ended up in court like this, but I take full responsibility for my actions. It was them or me. I am sorry for all the pain that my actions have caused. I am prepared to die if you say it is necessary. On May 15, 1992, she was given three more de death sentences. I sentence you in case number 91-463 to death for the murder of Troy Burris. Case number 91-304, I sentence you to death for the murder of Charles Humphreys. Case number 91-112, Citrus County case number, I sentence you to death for the murder of David Spears. In June 1992, Eileen pleaded guilty to the murder of Charles Edmund Karskoden. In November 1992, she re received her fifth death sentence. Records obtained reflect that from 1958 to 1962, Richard Mallory was committed for a treatment and observation resulting from a criminal charge of assault with intent to rape and received an overall eight years of treatment from the facility. In 1961, it was observed of Mr. Mallory that he possessed strong sociopathic trends. The judge refused to allow this to be admitted in court as evidence and denied Eileen's request for a retrial. In February of 1993, she pleaded guilty to the murder of Walter Antonio and when, was sentenced to death again. Eileen told several in, in, Eileen told several inconsistent stories about the killings. She claimed initially that all seven men had raped her while she was working as a prostitute, but later recanted the claim of self-defense, citing robbery and desire to leave no witnesses as the reason for the murder. I cannot go in the execution chamber and die in the execution chamber as a liar. And I cannot go in the execution chamber and be executed under the devil. I have to come clean and clean, cleanse my spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, so I have to come clean and tell the world the lies that went on through my mouth. I mean, the, now prosecutors and well, cops. And that, you, and that you killed the seven men. Huh? That you killed those men in cold blood. Yeah, and I've got to come clean that I killed those seven men in first degree murder and robbery. As they said, they had it right. A serial killer. Not so much like thrill kill. I was into the robbing biz. I mean, you know, serial killers are in this thrill killing jazz. I was into the robbing just and eliminate a witness. But still then again, I got a number, so it's a serial killer. But I'm coming clean before I go in that execution chamber and be executed that uh, I killed him. And like so this. when you met them from the beginning, did you know that you were going to kill them? 
when they picked you up in their cars? I pretty much, <clears throat> I pretty much had them so, uh, selected that they were going to die. During an interview with filmmaker Nick Broomfield, when she thought the cameras were off, she told them it was, in fact, self-defense. But she could not stand being on death row, where she had been for 10 years at that point, and she wanted to die. Assessed using the psychopathy checklist, Eileen scored 32 out of 40. The checklist evaluates individuals on a 20 item list of antisocial and interpersonal behaviors, with each item being scored at 0, 1, or 2, and that's a maximum score of 40. Depending on location and research perspective, scores above 25 or 30 are consistent with a diagnosis of psychopathy. Eileen was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections, Broward Correctional Institution, death row for women, then transferred to the Florida State Prison for execution. Her appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was denied in 1996. In a 2001 petition to the Florida Supreme Court, she stated her intention to dismiss her legal counsel and terminate all pending appeals. I killed those men, she wrote. Robbed them as cold as ice, and I'd do it again too. Yeah, Richard Mallory is definitely was not self-defense. Richard Mallory I killed and for, he had, uh, I needed his wheels to move the stuff and he had the right amount of money I needed to move into the apartment, so. But what about the testimony that you gave in court about? Oh, that's just, like I was saying. About the visine and... Oh, I was just doing a lying biz. It was just my lying gig trying to beat the system. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything, she said, because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. I'm so sick of hearing this. She's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm competent, sane. I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm the one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. Did you know that they were surveilling me before I killed? And then I knew it? And that it was covered up? Did you know there was helicopters dropping down from the sky? Deputy Sheriff with decoys picking me up four or five months before my arrest? It was covered up. But nonetheless, nobody ever asked me these the questions. Whether the cops were following you or not, Eileen. Oh, whether the cops were following me okay. or not, Eileen. Okay, what? Let's, say, let's say the cops were following you. Yeah. Let's say they were following uh -huh. you and they did everything that you're, you're saying they did. Uh huh. Nonetheless, yeah. you killed seven men. Yes, yeah, sure And I'm did. asking you, what got you to kill the seven men? And I'm men? telling you because the cops let me keep killing them, Nick. Don't yeah, you not, get it? Not everybody is killing seven people. So there must have been something in you that was getting you to Oh, do you that. are lost, Nick. So I was a hitchhiking hooker. Right. Running into trouble. I shoot, shoot the guy if I ran into trouble. Physical trouble. The cops knew it. When the physical trouble came along, let, him, let her clean the streets. And but, then we'll pull her in. But That's how come why. there was so much physical trouble? And just, it, because it was all in one year. Seven people in one oh, year. Oh, well. Oh, well. But why not say no? Because I'm out of retaliation for taking my life like this and getting rich off it all these years in, in total pathological lying. Yeah, thanks a lot. I lost my fucking life because of it. Couldn't even get a fair trial. Couldn't even get a fair investigation or nothing. While her attorneys argued that she was not mentally competent to make such a quest, she insisted that she knew what she was doing. And a court appointed panel of psychiatrists agreed. In 2002, Eileen began accusing prison matrons of tainting her food with dirt, saliva, and urine. Hey, I was tortured at BCI. They had, they had the intercom on in the room, and they kept lying that it wasn't on, and they were using sonic pressure on my head since 1997. Sonic pressure. And every time I was trying to write something, I, they, and I, I think they had some kind of eye in the cell, I'm not sure, but. Every time I started writing something, it went up higher. So I'm thinking that probably had the TV rigged. The TV or the mirror, something was rigged. They got a huge satellite on the compound. After they put the huge satellite on the compound, it could have been either rigged to the TV set or the mirror or something, because the electrician, when he put the mirror on the wall, he said, doesn't that look like a computer? 
the back of it and they stuck to the wall. And do you think what did that affect your mind, do you think? Huh? Did that affect your mind in some way, the sonic? It was crushing my head and they were using sonic pressure continually. Then when I had three meetings with Miss Villacorda on it, every meeting I had she increased the pressure of the volume of the calm, increased the harassment on the floor, increased the uh, trays being inedible, just increased every bit of my complaints and trashed all grievances. They were trying to make it look like I was crazy at all times, rig up the room with torture. If I said anything about their whole, I think their whole plan was to try to make it look like I was totally crazy. And so nobody would believe anything I had to say about anything. And then drive me there if they could. I suffered so bad. I was really struggling to survive. Had a lot of trays that were attempted murder and everything. I had to wash all my food off. And then one day I didn't wash my food off and I was sick for three weeks, almost died. Her attorney stated that Ms. Wernos really just wants to have proper treatment, humane treatment, until the day she's executed. He added she believes what she's written. You sabotaged my ass, society, and the cops, and the system. A raped woman got executed. It was used for books and movies and shit. Ladder climbs, the re-election, everything else. I got a big finger in all your faces, thanks a lot. You're inhuman, you're an inhumane bunch of fucking living bastards and bitches, and you're gonna get your asses nuked in the end. And pretty soon it's coming. 2019, a rock's supposed to hit you anyhow. You're all gonna get nuked. You don't take fucking human life like this and just sabotage and rip it apart like Jesus on the cross and say thanks a lot for all the fucking money I made off of you and not care about a human being and the truth being told. Now I know what Jesus was going through. They've been trying to tell the truth and I keep getting it stepped on. Concerned about if I was raped, if I, I'm not giving you book and movie info. I'm giving you info for investigations and stuff and that's it. We're gonna have to cut this interview, Nick. I'm not going to go into any more detail. I'm leaving. I'm glad. Thanks a lot, Society, for railroading my ass. Okay, let's go. Eileen's execution took place on October 9th, 2002, at the age of 46 at 9.47 a.m. She declined her last meal, which could have been anything under $20, and opted for a cup of coffee in instead. Her last words were, yes. I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June 6th, like the movie, big mothership and all, I'll be back. I'll be back. I'm prepared. I'm all right, I'm all right with it. How? I'm all right with it, but like I said, Remember, it tells, let them know that I know that the cops knew who I was after Richard Mallory died. I left prints everywhere and they covered it up and let me kill the rest of those guys to turn me into a serial killer. I know they did because I was no professional serial killer or anything. I'm a murderer or whatever you want to call it, you know. I wasn't professional at so, what I was doing. Eileen, how, I did how, some sloppy work, you know, and I left prints. You prepared yourself for tomorrow morning. I'm all right with it. She was the 10th woman in the United States and the second in Florida to be executed since the 1976 United States Supreme Court decision restoring capital punishment. Her body was cremated and her ashes were spread beneath a tree in her native Michigan by her childhood friend, Don Watkins. I'm okay. I'm okay. God is going to be there. Jesus Christ is going to be there. All the angels and everything. And, you know, whatever, whatever's on the beyond, I think it's going to be more like Star Trek beaming me up into a space vehicle, man. Then I move on, recolonize to another planet or whatever. But it's whatever's the beyond, I know it's going to be good because I didn't do anything as wrong as they said. I did the right thing. And I saved a lot of people's butts from getting hurt and raped and killed, too. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Halloween special.
look forward to more spooky stories through the month of October. Have a great one. We'll catch you in the next one. Stay safe. Love you.